Well, we've been exploring here at church uh, eschatology. There it is on the screen. And uh, the study of the end of the world over the last couple of weeks. Uh, But today I want to get a bit more personal. Less so looking at the end of the world, but more so looking at the end of your world. Okay, when the death comes knocking and your life ends. Now, I think no culture in the world suppresses this topic more than ours. If you don't believe me, next to your dinner party, ask the question, has anyone thought about their death lately? See how that goes down. We don't talk about it. I've got, a, I've got hundreds of notes from my kids from school. Not one of them had said, at school we're going to be learning about the topic of death coming up. It's taboo. We don't talk about our kids. We don't talk about with one another. And yet... That's not optional, is it? It's not like it affects this group, but not this group, right? Mortality has a 100% success rate. It doesn't matter who you voted for. It doesn't matter how much you earn, your age, your orientation. It's very inclusive, right? Unless Jesus returns, you and I will cark it. Now, I know what you're thinking. Gee, this is an uplifting way to start a Sunday morning. You're welcome. There's a big reason why we need to talk about it. Over the summer, I read this book on the, on the screen. Bill Bryson read a book called The Body. And each, it's a guide for occupants, right? It goes through each chapter. There's a different part of the body. Their heart, your hands, your brain. Very good book. And the last chapter is about death, about dying, about the end. And he says, we prolong it as much as we can, but we cannot prevent it. And the last two lines of this book is this, as he talks about the way in which the body dies. He says this, and that's you gone. But it was good while it lasted, wasn't it? Now that is a sentence or two that captures our secular world. If this is all there is, there's nothing to come, It was good while it lasted, wasn't it? I hope. The reason we bring up the topic of death, the reason is because Jesus brings it up and he speaks into this conversation that we would like to turn away from and offers real meaningful hope that you do not have to suppress it but be excited by it. It is not taboo but it is something you can be confident in. He wants you to have more than just It was good while it lasted, wasn't it? So what we're going to do, we're going to do three things. We're going to look at the topic of death. Then we're going to look at the topic of resurrection, the hope that Jesus offers. And then we're going to look at rewards in heaven. What you do now impacts the age to come. So let's start with death. Let me ask you this question, which I don't know if you've been asked before or thought about. Why is it that we die? Why do we die? Most people say, which is natural. It's always been the case. It always will be. It's sort of a natural phenomenon. But Jesus answers that question very differently. Why do we die? See, to answer, we need to go back to the beginning where death was born. In the first two chapters of Genesis, in the first book of the Bible, there God creates mankind. It says in Genesis 2, on the screen, verse 7, God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, when God made Adam and then Eve, he gave them first a body and then breathed life into them. And then he said to Adam and Eve, they're in this garden, in this world that was bliss. There are a tree of life and then there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from that tree, it will lead to death. In other words, a choice. God has given them life. Do they want to continue in relationship with the God who brings life or reject that God? which leads to death and sin. And you know the story. They chose death. Whenever you choose sin, it always leads to death. Now, it's interesting. Satan came along and said, surely you won't die. And he's right. At one level, he's right. Eve didn't pick that uh, fruit, eat it, and then drop dead, right? What happened was the beginning of the end. As they rejected God, the curse lay upon Adam and Eve. Sin began to rule. Death reigned. And the bodies slowly began to decay. 
And as Adam and Eve walked out of that garden, they eventually one day will die. It's like a laptop. You know, a laptop's charged in, you're confident, fine, but you detach that laptop and you have a little bit more confidence, you know, 100%, 90% battery. But you know eventually what's going to happen if you do not connect it back to the power, don't you? You know, when it's 100%, 90%, there's a confidence. You know what that's called in the real world? Being under 30. You know, you're just like, I'm fine, it's all good, and you just live your life. But then it goes 50%, 40%, 10%, 5%, and you get nervous. Because you know what's going to happen. But for Adam and Eve, it was not just them. Their choice, the vibrations of it affected generations later. Romans 5 says this, Just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all people, because all sinned. That when you go to the doctor and they ask you for your medical history, right? There's a whole bunch of things that have been inherited to you that you had no choice over from your parents. But your first parents, Adam and Eve, a whole bunch of spiritual DNA was imparted to you. That their choice affects you because we're all human. We were all out of sync with God. You may think, well, I, had not, I wasn't there. But every choice that you make that rejects God confirms the fact that you are living in the footprints of Adam and Eve. We are all affected by this. All our bodies are slowly decaying. All our batteries are running out. And the reality is nothing that you do will change that. No matter how many sudokus, no matter what diet, no matter how much you bench, no matter how much positive thinking, no matter how much of a good person you are, death will come knocking. I mean, look, I gave, someone gave me this the other day, last year actually. It's an Aesop soap. It's called... The resurrection duet. <laughs> so I had high expectations. It says a superior cleansing gel, a resurrection aromatic hand wash. Now, they're setting expectations very high, but this will be good for my hands after I'm a day in the garden, right? When I die at my funeral, if this is placed on my hands or my body, it is going to do nothing. And if we think that death is natural, we will look for natural solutions and all of them will fail. Jesus says why we die is a far more spiritual reason. We are out of sync with the God who gives life. And so as Romans 7 says, who will deliver me from the body of death? Notice it's who, not what. We look for the what, the cure, the scientific advancement. But no, no, Jesus, you need to look for the who. Who will deliver us from this body and death? No soap, no nothing will do it, but who? And this is where Jesus comes in. This is the second point, resurrection. If the problem is spiritual, then the solution is likewise. Have a look, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. Enter Jesus. See, why did Jesus come as a human? Why did God become one of us. Because the only way to deliver your body is through another body. So he took on flesh, he became one of us. And yet, why was it important that Jesus was not just one of us? He wasn't just human. Because he'd still be under the curse. He'd be just like one of us. It'd be like a leper helping a leper. Not much help, right? But he was born of a virgin. God incarnate. So he's not like us. But Jesus is like us, and yet he's not like us. He's only one qualified to help us with our problem of death. And it's interesting how he helped, right? Well, Jesus, while on earth, went to a couple of funerals. One of them was his friend Lazarus. And there Lazarus has been in the grave, and Jesus says those words, come out, and Lazarus comes out of the grave. And you know what every other guest is thinking at that time? I hope Jesus comes to my funeral, right? When you want him at yours? And yet he couldn't, could he? Jesus physically couldn't be at every funeral of his followers. There's not enough time. And so he went to his own. He went to a cross. He went to his own funeral, though that spiritually speaking, he would be at yours. And that your funeral would not be the end. See, there Jesus on that cross, 
He took on sin, sin that was not his own, but the sin of Adam and Eve, the sin of you on himself, and he experienced a consequence which was death. There he became the curse. His body was broken so that you would be free. That he rose again, that God said to Jesus, about it, come out, so that Jesus would say at your funeral one day, come out. Under Adam, we cannot escape the power of death. We live and then we die, but under Jesus, there is a new order. He conquered death. He crushed it. And so the new pattern is we live, we die, and then we live. Have a look. Romans 6 says, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. There's a pastor in uh, Perth called Rory Shiner, and he wrote a book called Raised Forever. And this is what he says. Christianity, at its heart, is a rebel's religion. The problem with the world is that it's far too conservative. It might look radical, but it is deeply submissive. So embarrassingly wedded to the ancient regime of death. It says to death, you win, sir. I understand that. I don't mean to argue or to appear insubordinate, but would it be okay if I played for little first? But the resurrection of Jesus says, with the resurrection of Jesus, that we do not say, you win. We say to death, you lose. We refuse the status quo. We refuse to submit. We refuse to let the thug win. In other words, 1 Corinthians 15, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Now, I know some of you are thinking, but James, I can't, that, that, to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that, I would, that takes too much faith. But can I subtly suggest, if you think that once you die, that's it, that takes faith as well. The reason I have faith is because of what Jesus said, did, that he died and rose again. If your faith is just, if your belief is just based on a hunch, a gut that once you die, that's it. That type of faith I cannot have. It's too much for me. I need a bit more solidness. But it's not just faith that Jesus' resurrection brings. It's hope. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, he sets a visible picture of what's to come. The first fruits, a taste, a picture of his reality will become your reality. We read it, 1 Corinthians 15 says this, So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown imperishable, raised imperishable. It's sown in dishonor, will be raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown in a natural body, raised in a spiritual body. If you're thinking, what will my resurrected body be like? Have you ever wondered that? Now, you might be thinking, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask that. No, no, you are. It's good to wonder. It's foolish to think, to wonder and think, I don't think that's possible, right? Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. It's foolish to think, well, look, a body without my blood cells, immune system that doesn't break down, doesn't die, that can't happen. But Paul goes on to say, it's like looking at a seed and thinking, a tree from that? Pull the other one. God can do it. God can make the, imperish- the perishable imperishable. But it is good to wonder and to yearn, what is your resurrected body going to be look like? God gives us a brochure of what's to come, of what you will be like. And it is oh so familiar and yet radically different. Your resurrected body, the, what you are going to be like in heaven, right, It's not a ghost or a spirit. You're not going to be Casper. No, no, no. Jesus is pro your body. He died for your body to resurrect it. And when we see Jesus rise from the dead, right, Jesus didn't have to reintroduce himself to those around. I mean, at first they didn't recognize him because they're overcome with grief, right? But he didn't have to say, hey, by the way, I'm Jesus. You're Jesus? Yeah. Well, I didn't recognize you. No, no, no. They recognized him instantly. It's not like Jesus transformed into this Hollywood Crims Hemsworth or this massive guy with abs, you know. Wow, you know, he's not perfect in the Hollywood sense. It was him. They saw him, a resurrected him. Friends, resurrection is not the rejection or the replacement of you. It is the resurrection of you. If you are wondering, what will I be like in heaven? Look at you. You will still be a man, a woman, your ethnicity, your personality. It will be you. You will recognize you and you will recognize others. 
oh so familiar, and yet radically different. Currently, you are not who you really are. Do you know that? Sin has affected you so much in all sorts of ways, but in your future body, you will be the fullest sense you. Untouched by sin, indestructible, perfect. That you will never struggle in your body again. In this room, there are those who have chronic pain in all sorts of ways, and each day to get out of bed is an effort. Your resurrected body, that will be a distant memory. Some of you wake up with a broken mind, whether it comes with, you see the, the world in a state of depression or a state of constant anxiety, but in the world, you will see the world clearly every day. Some of you battle with a gender dysphoria where your body doesn't match your mind and one that you will have peace and that turmoil will go. Some of you battle with overeating or undereating, that will go. Some of you struggle with, you have to be careful of what you eat and one day you'll be eating all the gluten you want. Some of you long to run, to leap, to dance, to see clearly, to sing like you once did, and that will be your norm for all eternity. Some of you look and stand in front of the mirror and you see all that is wrong with your body. But for all eternity, you'll be seeing your body and see all that is right. That is coming. You can never dwell on that truth enough. But there is a bit of confusion, I think, of resurrected bodies. We know we'll not, what will not be there, sin, death, decay, pain. But sometimes we lump into what's not going to be there. Some things that the Bible doesn't say, like learning or being creative or being challenged or problem solving. Sometimes we think of heaven almost like the matrix where we get there and think, you know, we just get uploaded with a whole bunch of information, you know, oh, I know Kung Fu. You know, we just, sometimes we think it just, it'd be instant. And then, so we're tempted to think, well, heaven's just going to be boring because I know everything, I've done everything, it's just so easy. But who said heaven's going to be like that? Imperishable does not mean tedious or monotonous. You will have resurrected bodies, right, which are free from pain, which means you can push your body to the nth degree. You see that massive mountain, and think, I'm going to climb it. It's going to be challenged, but I'm going to do it. Engage in that team sport and fun. Run that race. Push your personal best. Dance to all you want, right? You have a resurrected body that is free to enjoy and push it. But you know what will not be there? Injury. The jealous comparison of others, feeling inadequate, the shame of what other people think of you if you don't make it. In your resurrected body, you will have the opportunity to learn and to grow and to wonder and to expand your mind with ideas and truths and discoveries. But you know what will not be there? Feeling dumb or feeling arrogant, superior than others. In your resurrected body, you will have perfect relationship with others in their resurrected body. You know those times when you have a conversation with someone and it's really good for the soul? That will be the norm as you interact with people you've known and people that you are getting to know for all eternity. And there will not be in those conversations the fear of rejection. You will not have to self-protect yourself. You could be open and honest in complete trust and love. Your resurrected body is coming for those in Jesus Christ and it is going to be glorious. It will meet all your dreams and longings and then surpass them by a million miles. But you might be thinking, hey, well, that's coming, right? And that comes when Jesus returns. All those in Christ will get resurrected body. What about now? What if you die now before Jesus returns? Where are you now? Where are those who have put their trust in Jesus? Where are they? You ever wondered that? Because no one gets a resurrected body early, right? Now, some say, well, we just sort of fall asleep until we meet Jesus. And yet, have a look what Philippians says on the screen. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, is Christ and to die is gain. I desire to be the part and be with Christ. Well, remember the thief next to Jesus on the cross. 
What does Jesus say to him? Today you'll be with me in paradise. See, when you die, you, if you follow Jesus, you'll be instantly with Christ. You will see him. In this intermediate state between being with Christ and before you get a resurrected body. And that, friends, is immense comfort. I remember when I was young and we're at a McDonald's uh, playground. And if you know McDonald's playground, lots of tubes and that kind of thing. And you go in and out and all sorts of slides. And I remember going through them. And when I was about four or five, I was quite scared. I was the oldest child, right? So there's no older brother, older sister to help me. I was scared because I had to go through this tunnel and it was dark and that kind of thing. But I knew that my dad was on the other side. And so I went through this tunnel with tears, you know, I was really freaking out. But then when I came through, I saw my dad's face. And the reality is, friends, we don't know how we will die. Some of you, it might be a horrific accident. Others, a slow battle with cancer or Alzheimer's. And no matter how many people are around you, you still have to go through death by yourself. And yet, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are not by yourself. Because as you go through it, the first thing that you will see is his face. That is immense comfort. You will not do death alone. What about now? Third and final thing, rewards in heaven. It is tempting to think, well, if the resurrected body is coming, if heaven's coming, as done by Jesus, then I just sit back, grab a pina colada, and just wait for his return. And yet 2 Corinthians 5, which was read to us before, says this, we must all, keyword all, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. That all includes Christians. Now, most people think that the reward for the way you live your life is heaven. Uh Uh-uh. Heaven is a gift, right? The only way you get to heaven is through the Lord Jesus. But Jesus does speak about rewards in heaven, that what you do now doesn't give two cents, really, for how to get there, right? Because we're all going to fail at that. But what you do now does impact the way, oh, sorry, what does impact what life is like there, right? So the reward is not heaven, but there are rewards in heaven. We don't speak about rewards in heaven all that much, really. I don't know why, but we don't speak about it all that much, but Jesus did. There's a couple of things on the screen. Matthew 5 says this, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. Rejoice, be glad. But great is your reward in heaven. 1 Corinthians 4, each will receive their praise from God. Luke 14, when it comes to giving to the poor, although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of righteousness. Jesus is saying there is a clear link for the Christian that what you do now impacts the way that, that there is a reward to come. That not all Christians will receive the same. We will receive the same Lord Jesus, same new heavens, new earth, but the reward will be different. Not all will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That there is an inspection coming, brothers and sisters, on what God has entrusted you with. You know, there's an inspection coming on the way in which you've used the things that he's given you. Your time. Your job. Your gifts, your abilities, your opportunities, your money. Those you're responsible for, if you have children, them. And he wants to see, have you used them faithfully? Not for yourself, but for God's glory. Because if you have, there is a reward coming. And this reward is praise from God, honor from God. It's treasures in heaven. It's more responsibility. Those entrusted with little will be given more and use it well. That God right now... He sees you as perfect and holy in sight, right? That your salvation is secure. But the way in which you... He's noticing the way in which you live. He's observing that. And when you give money generously, right, and you don't hold on to it, you give it for God's kingdom, he sees that and one day will honour that in the age to come. But when you are made fun of, maybe at school or work with your family and friends for following Jesus and everyone thinks you're an idiot... 
He sees that and one day will honour you and esteem for not being ashamed of him. He sees the time that you've dedicated not doing the things that necessarily you'd like to do, but that you get to do as you disciple others, use your gifts. He sees that and he shows you those you've invested in heaven. That you may be a nobody in this world, that you want to humbly serve others in this age, and you may be overlooked, but in the age to come, you'll be vindicated and honoured. Because there, the last will be first. Jesus looks at his people and says, Some of us are bad investors. We're short sighted. We focus on the now. We want the praise and approval now from people around us. We want to hold on to the money now and not let go. We want the experiences now. We live for this age. But heaven will expose those who are the better investors. Who knew that this age is not all there is and lived accordingly. And can I just say, this brings profound hope and purpose in what you do. Because a lot of life can feel like in vain. What I call the COVID safe app. It was deleted the other day. (laughs) Millions of dollars spent for what? And a lot of life can feel like that. We've even worked hard at something godly, good work, and yet it hasn't eventuated anything. You've discipled your kids in the the, the fear and knowledge of the Lord, and yet they've walked away. You've been praying and praying for that non-Christian friend, and nothing's happened. You you have given your life to a local church, and yet there's not been as much fruit as you thought, and it can feel like it's in vain. You've been giving money away, and you think, what's it going towards? Why am I setting it for Jesus when I keep copying it? It can feel like in vain a COVID safe app. But friends, God sees. And you do it for one reason. Those words when he sees you at the end of time, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, is it wrong to be motivated by these rewards? You might be feeling a bit guilty. If you want the praise from God, you want treasures in heaven, is it wrong? Absolutely not. As Matthew 6 says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. God has these rewards for the believer to inspire, to motivate you to not live for the now, but live for the one to come. Because that inspection is coming, friends, on how you've lived your life. And the fact that Jesus has not returned means there is time to steward, to look after the things that God has entrusted you with, to sit loose, to be travelers in this earth that are just passing by, to aim for those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let me end with a sobering stat. In the course of this sermon, around the world, 3,000 people have died. Now, no one in this room has that I can see, but one person every second, 106 every minute, 6,000 every hour. And one day, friends, that stat will include you, as it will include me. And Jesus wants you to be ready for that moment, not to suppress it, not to deny it, not to pretend like it's not happening. He wants you to look forward to it. To have more than just, I hope it was good while it lasted. And the only way, the only way possible is look to the one who's defeated death on that first Easter Sunday. Who gives you a hope that this body is good but broken and one day it will be glorious when you pass through death and go the other side. And that what you do now, even though others may tell you Following Jesus, a waste of time. The way in which you've been generous, the way in which you've stood up for you, a waste of time. You do it now for one purpose. For those words from Lord Jesus, he looks you in the eye, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome home. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are people of the present. It is so easy just to live in the now, even as people who know that heaven is coming. We ask, Lord, by the power of your Spirit that you would shake us up, that we would sit loose to this world. 
We know, Lord, that death is coming. But we ask that as we look to you, Lord Jesus, that you would, we'd be inspired and excited by that first fruit, a taste of what is to come. That the best truly is yet to come because you defeated death. You, the grave, the, it, the tomb is empty. And so we ask, Lord, that we would be people of hope, real hope, that transforms not only the now, but that we'd live in light of the what is to come. And so we look forward to that glorious resurrected body. We look forward to seeing what you have to say to us, Lord, for the times that we have served you here. And we look forward to life with you forever. Amen.